Welcome to this episode of Season 4 of The Common Bridge, where policy and current events are discussed in a fiercely nonpartisan manner. The host, Richard Helpe, is a philanthropist, entrepreneur, and political analyst who has reached over 3.5 million listeners, viewers, and readers around the world. The Common Bridge is available on the Substack website and the Substack app. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can find the program on YouTube and wherever you get your podcasts. The Common Bridge draws guests and audiences from across the political spectrum, and we invite you to become a free or paid subscriber on your favorite medium. Hello, welcome to The Common Bridge. I'm your host, Rich Helpe, and today we've got the president and CEO of the Small Business Association of Michigan, Mr. Brian Kelly. Brian, welcome to The Common Bridge. Thanks for inviting me. Pleasure to be with you today. A lot, I'm happy you're here. A lot of people uh, know about your success in the private sector, your extensive uh, public service, uh, particularly as the Lieutenant Governor for the state of Michigan, uh, two terms in the Michigan House of Representatives, two terms as Ionia County Commissioner, and prior to that, over 10 years with the community banking industry. And you still serve on the uh, board of a bank as well as Oakland University and many other uh, charitable uh, endeavors. Um, uh, but today we want to talk about workforce. The work world is changing. Uh, factories are being automated. There's remote work, or is there um, artificial intelligence? And so much of our tax base is wrapped around employment. Um, so today, uh, Brian Kelly is uh, a true policy expert about these things. Um, and we're also going to talk today about uh, one of his achievements while Lieutenant Governor. Um, that is the Gordy Howe International Bridge spanning the Detroit River. Um, but Brian, welcome to the show. And uh, just to introduce yourself to our listeners, our readers and our viewers, where were your early days in your education and maybe a little bit about your career arc if I've missed anything? Yeah, no, I appreciate uh, the invitation and, and uh, very flattered to get uh, to get an invite like this. I wanted to, I, I, you know, I want to tell you a little bit about SBAM and what we're doing right now. But just looking back uh, briefly, born and raised in uh, in Michigan. So when I was really little in the Detroit area and then my family after my dad got out of the army was settled in the center part of the state where I still reside today in Ionia County. And um, I was in the banking industry straight away, uh, was not really expecting to go into politics. I was always interested in politics, a volunteer involved, knocking on doors for other candidates, that sort of thing. But um, it was really getting involved at the local level, the Ionia County Board of Commissioners. It kind of gave me the bug where I thought about, you know, maybe doing it on a more full time basis. And I ran for state representative and served during some of Michigan's most trying times. 2007, 8, 9, and 10, I was in the House of Representatives, and those were really, really difficult times. The, the, the financial crisis around the globe hit Michigan especially hard. We were essentially in a, in a, in a recession or near recession for, for the whole decade, the first decade of the century. And then I met a person named Rick Snyder. I'd never heard of him before when he decided to run for governor, and uh, we really kind of hit it off. And, and that... Um, that really did culminate in me joining the ticket with him in 2010. And what exciting times. There were huge uh, changes Michigan had to make. You know, I hear about the, the, these days they talk about, a, you know, the state budget being like $80 billion. But, you know, after that great financial crisis and how low Michigan had, had sank when Rick and I first took office, Michigan only had about $46 billion. Uh, this back in 2011 uh, to balance its budget on. So it was a very, very different time, but a time when we had to rebuild and make big changes. And those big changes turned to, from population losses into population growth. It turned economic and uh, job losses into economic growth and, and very robust uh, job growth to go along with that. So a very exciting time. And then uh, when my my uh, time at, in public office as lieutenant governor ended. The, um, I, I joined as a leader here at the Small Business Association of Michigan, not to be confused with the Small Business Administration of the United States federal government. So the USSBA that does loans and guarantees different organization. We're a trade association just for small businesses, 31,000 members in every industry you can think of spread across every literally every county, all 83 counties in Michigan. And it's a, um, 
it's it's a it's an unusually large association uh, in terms of membership, the largest of its kind in America by a lot, and uh, and it's really a testament to how big small businesses in Michigan. You know, we think about corporate giants being headquartered in Michigan, but uh, and we're luck- lucky to have them. But the uh, but even those companies started as small companies. You know, like mm-hmm. think about Dow and Stryker, Ford, Gerber, Kellogg. You know, these are multinational corporate names for the rest of the world. But here in Michigan, those are family names. And uh, in some cases, family still around <laughs> that uh, mm-hmm. that started those those companies. So that small business ecosystem is in our DNA here. And uh, so it's just an, an honor to work on behalf and before uh, on behalf and, um, and alongside small businesses and uh, to see what's happening today, which it's uh, really, especially since the pandemic, We've seen record new small business starts and um, and the five-year survival rate starting to trend upward, which is a really, really powerful combination. Those are topics very close to my heart, having you know been a startup entrepreneur multiple times. Um, it, it's, a, it's an all-in, and it's a rare business that goes the five years or you know 15 years or multi-generational, like the Gerbers and the Kellogg's and the other uh, great institutions of the state of Michigan. Um, and I know there's a lot on the mind of the small business community today, and a chief among them is getting a good workforce. Um, so what is the labor situation today, and, and, and what's the mission? Uh, you know, what, what are the, some of the objectives, and is Michigan different than other places? Like, you know, you hear Florida's booming. What are, what are we finding out about the workforce in Michigan today, and how does it relate to the rest of the country? Yeah, we are in a uh, predicament here in Michigan. We have a perfect storm of issues working against us right now when it comes to workforce. So we have a um, we have a, a low labor force participation rate. So about sixty percent of those in the labor force, according to economic standards, so it'd be over age 16 and still alive. That's the de- denominator of the fraction and then um, available and looking or in the workforce being the numerator of that fraction. So it's 60%. Um, leading states are more like 65, 66, 67%. Mm-hmm. So it's a it's a pretty big difference. Uh, Michigan's labor force participation, if you were to go all the way back to the year 2000, so 23 years ago, it was 68.8%. That's over 700,000 fewer people in our workforce today as compared to uh, the year 2000. So what's happening there? We do see um, prime working age um, labor force participation actually is about 4% less than it was 20% 20 years ago. That is um, that's that hurts us in, in the worst way. I mean, that's the, the girth that 25 to 54 is what economies, economists call prime working age. So that's fallen back some. Uh, there are some reasons that we've identified uh, for it that we can get into later that I think deserve some policy responses. Um, but we also are an older than average state. So our birth rate does not keep up with the people that are exiting the workforce and the number of people that die each year. And so that that puts us in a position where our population, our uh, population outside of immigration or migration of people, is it's locked in for the next 20 years at least. It's going to go down. And, uh, that and so that is, yeah, that's really quite a predicament. Labor force participation rate is is low. Uh, our our birth rate is not what it used to be because our average age is higher and more people are exiting the workforce than entering it in Michigan. Kind of a perfect storm. So as hard as it is to find people today, it will get harder in the next decade. D- does that older population, older workforce mean there's more opportunity for an ambitious young person? to come to Michigan and build a business and build a a career. I really think that that's a a great insight. And when you, when you consider there's, there's a lot of places that are exciting to go and to be, and you brought up like uh, Florida, when you look at net outbound migration since the pandemic, uh, new census numbers have come out uh, recently that show the two, the three biggest gainers of Michigan outbound migration, uh, Florida, Texas, and North Carolina. And, but that, the, the Sun Belt is really gaining a, a lot of people. Now, we do have some net inbound migration from a few places, uh, places that used to take our young people. 
places like Illinois and Chicago, we have net inbound migration now. From New York, we have net inbound migration. But overall, across the whole country, we are down. So where are people going? Sunbelt is definitely one of those places. A lot of energy, a lot of growth, a lot of excitement, a lot of building. And uh, and so it's. I think there, we, it does deserve investigation as to what makes those uh, places so special or such an attraction. But there is a ton of demand and opportunity here in Michigan, a lower cost of living than some of those other places too. And, uh, and so that does create opportunities. You have um, an older than average population. Uh, it means that more slots in senior level positions and uh, in high up areas uh, and, and also in, in entrepreneurship and just kind of gaps in the marketplace, there will be lots of opportunity here in Michigan. But I think it's important to uh, to acknowledge that that it's not just people don't necessarily follow jobs. In fact, these days, jobs follow people quite a bit. And, uh, and I think one a good example would be for all the, the talk of Michigan luring in, uh, say, Ford Motor Company to build a battery plant in Michigan. Those are production level jobs. But when it came to a new engineering center, it went to Atlanta, Georgia. And, mm-hmm. uh, and so when you, when you think of it, that young, new, up, upstart talent um, and where are they going and looking for it, uh, well, production jobs are you know it's an, those are a kind of a nice to have it's you know I, I understand why our state has kind of targeted those uh in their incentives but it it really having that um the high value add early stage that design and engineering and um that those types of i think we have to be really clo- careful not to lose those parts of that production process and that's where you see a ton of engagement with smaller firms that are part of that ecosystem for larger supply chains. So that's what I love about what we do here in Michigan is that it's not like we've got standalone small businesses and then you got small businesses that are part of huge supply chain operations. And while the at the end of the day, there's a product that's sold by a big company um, like a like an automotive company, for example, or med- medical appliance manufacturer or um, or chemical manufacturing and uh, furniture manufacturing, that all throughout that supply chain, there are tons of smaller companies that really are nimble and creative and innovative and are feeding into the supply chain. So to, the way I look at it, a small business has a piece of the success at every level of business. And uh, and that's what where we have an, an opportunity here in Michigan, those big Company supply chains do create opportunity for for smaller companies, but but that's not just that. I think that we have to um, we have to take a page for just the 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 energy and uh, I'm going to use the word placemaking because I can't think of a better term or there's not been a better term invented yet that I know of because you know placemaking. Some people is like make sure you have nice uh, curbs and flower pots on Main Street. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is vibrancy and energy, high quality of life, just the, the types of amenities that draw in uh, next generation that aren't just following where the job is, but instead you got to have the job and the, and the opportunity for a career outside of just a job, but also the place that they can see themselves making a life and spending their free time and building a family. Well, we, we've certainly got um, enough of those in the state of Michigan. Uh, the fun things, the festivals, you know, literally 12 months a year um, and plenty of outdoor recreation, plenty of cultural development. Um, and of course, I'm very excited about what's happening in the city of Detroit. I mean, we have just a, a resolute uh, focus on the future um, and that I think Detroit's on the upswing and uh, not uh, likely to go backward. Um, and when you talk about place, uh, I, I've heard you speak before about the linkage uh, among housing, employment, education, and training and thriving businesses. It's kind of all of these are necessary in order to create demand for a workforce. Um, what's going on in the in your organization to try to make sure that housing, education, uh, and opportunities there? We take a real broad view on what it takes to be successful, to create an environment of success around small businesses. And 
it's it comes from just the knowledge that a, a a small business is located in in an area and most of the time that small business can't just pick up and go someplace else and it's not like where in the world do we want to be because that small business owner has made a life in the likely in the community where they're operating and it's their it's the talent pool they draw from their connections their uh, credibility, their you know their resources, just their whole life built around a community, and that, so then when you take that now, it's like the community that they're in is the one that they're or the you know the region that they're really um, tied to. Then to recognize that places need business, business needs people, and people want place. All of those we think of like a triangle. All these things are connected, and if any one of them are not working optimally, none of them will work optimally. So that does give us a pretty broad view on what is a business issue. We spend a lot of time on people and place issues because uh, it's required for workforce, which is our biggest challenge in the future. Uh, there is a shortage of housing in Michigan. It started during the Great Recession when we had a big outbound migration of people in, um, in the first decade of the century. And we lost a lot of tradespeople and new build permits plummeted. So now we find ourselves with a housing stock that is an average age of about 50 years old, and we're short almost 200,000 housing units. And even when new units are being built, a lot of times they don't match up with the market. The people that need housing and, and the housing that's available, they just, they miss. So we know that we've got a big housing issue and challenge, and we need supply side solutions to deal with it. The, uh, the other area that uh, that we've really gotten involved in is in child care, where we have a, people that left the workforce temporarily or in some cases long term, but really intend to get back in uh, throughout the uncertainty of the pandemic. And um, the shortage in child care is so acute that remember that prime working age, and I talked about the number of people that have fallen out in prime working age, child care is a piece of that answer. So uh, that's really, we've really focused on child care on both supply and um, affordability uh, of, uh, of options for younger families with children. And then beyond that, another area in that lower prime working age work uh, labor force participation, um, we believe that about Half of the 4% drops, remember there's a 4% drop in 25 to 54 year olds in the last 20 years in their labor force participation. About half of that 4% drop we believe is directly tied to opioid addiction. And um, cool. that it's really kind of staggering when you think about like the impact. Well, is, there are another is, seven, that, yeah, please go ahead. Demo, is that a demographic change this, you know, fewer people because they've aged into another bracket? So it's not looking at the same population. It would be looking at the population as it existed at a point in time and then the population as it exists today. But it's, yes, that's true. But it's important to understand that we're talking about proportion of the total. So not only did the pie shrink, but the percentage of people in that shrunken pie has gone down 4%. I see. So well, you know, one of the things I read about- It's similar down its face. In, in uh, that I, I was really cheered about in um, preparing to talk today, you've got a real focus on employing everyone, you know, age, disability, what have you. And uh, over the weekend, um, I was in a coffee shop in Livonia, and the, the there was a little placard on the counter uh, that said our, our team member um, is deaf, so just you know here here is a a plastic menu circle what you want. And I'm thought, hallelujah, here's somebody that's got a job, minor modification, and now one more person in the workforce. So you're expanding that workforce amongst the other populations that you're getting to work based on their age, based on whether they need child care, based on can we accommodate their disability. Is there a way to help people come back from opioid addiction and rejoin the workforce? There is, and it requires us to look at addiction as a healthcare issue rather than a criminal justice issue. So people that are dealing drugs, yeah, that's a criminal justice issue, but being addicted, and then there's a whole bunch of things when a person goes into drug-seeking mode, their brain is literally not working right because of that addiction. The idea of treat a treatment-based approach 
based on evidence-based practices, including medically assisted treatment, uh, is really changing the uh, those trends. It's more possible for people to recover from addiction than before. And, uh, and so employing that, infusing it into the criminal justice system, that's why you see SBAM so involved in criminal justice reform, child care issues, disability uh, employment, um, our, our, our K-12 issue, uh, benefit cliff issues on social services. All of that work goes right back down to this perfect storm of demographic challenges that we face in saying, okay, look, for at least the next 20 years, we know that except for inbound migration, that our, the demographics of our population are such that we are going to shrink. And if, since that's the case, we have to have a higher level of success in getting people into the workforce among that pie that we have. So who's out of the workforce? And we look at it and say, okay, people that have been through the criminal justice system, what can we do in, in the areas to, to, uh, to divert people from jail or if they're already there to, to give them a new pathway? Things like vocational village and prison teaching skilled trades and people have a high degree of employability as they leave. And that's been a uh, wildly successful uh, effort in reducing recidivism and independence after leaving uh, incarceration. Like these are things that are solvable. And while our system tends to want to see, you know, like what are, we've got this labor force challenge and it's locked in for the next 20 years, what can we do? And, and it defies some big sweeping across the board answer. It, and rather it's looking at li literally dozens of different populations, understanding what are the barriers to them getting into the workforce, and then having consistently applied successful uh, programming or answers, barrier removal for each of those populations to make a little bit of incremental progress. So when we look at like child care, look, there's a, there's a subset of the, child, of the population that fixing or aiding in the child care uh, process or conundrum for many families will uh, will help. There's, it's just a subset. If we do everything right there, it'll make our labor force participation rate a little bit higher. If we're more successful in getting people with disabilities, you know, you talked about that, uh, the question in disabilities oftentimes, one of the things that scares employers away is this word reasonable accommodation from the, from the Americans with Disabilities Act. It sounds scary, like, wow, that sounds like it could be expensive. But the really cool thing that more and more employers are finding is not only do you get more loyalty and longevity out of employees with disabilities, but when you figure out what is the accommodation you need to make for that employee, it tends, up, it tends to be a, an accommodation that simplifies the process makes it more accurate, increases customer service, and helps every other employee involved. So in your example with circling the menu, I'll bet you that that employee who is hard of hearing is more accurate with filling orders than people that are listening to an order and writing it down. It's Indeed. taken a step or an, an opportunity for mistake out of it. It's probably a good process for every employee to use, not just those that are hard of hearing. Yeah, you know, what I really like about the way you're talking is that you, you're looking at the problem, breaking it down, applying solutions as we go. Um, and, you know, with, you know, good government, you know, a kindness, the, you know, I've always said this country is filled with compassionate and generous people um, and people that, you know, in government, people that are in the private sector. Um, it's just very encouraging. Um, but you've got some headwinds from a policy perspective. Um, things like independent contractor requirements, temporary employment agencies, and the one that and I, I worked in um, retail and restaurant hospitality, uh, predictive scheduling. Um, it's really difficult to legislate something like that. Um, wage disclosure and job maintenance requests. What are some of the headwinds you're seeing on the policy front? There is a barrage of proposals coming through the political process right now at the state level and then some through regulatory means at the federal level uh, that would really dampen all of this energy that we see happening in entrepreneurship in the last few years. So if you're to look back, starting halfway through 2020, continuing through 2021 and 2022, we saw people really turn to entrepreneurship. And a very common way that people do that is by becoming an independent contractor. 
It's a very common way that people start a new business. They might have a professional career and they've got a, some sort of a, a, a trade or a professional service that they do for one company as an employee, and they decide to leave that employment and their former employer is their first customer. And yeah. uh, But then they, they hang a shingle and they're doing it for other people, but they're working as an independent contractor before they're ready to grow and take on employees. Uh, there are There is a proposal that that is a it's like a fight between big companies and big labor um like and and small and these these proposals are are really um the collateral damage would be small businesses that are getting formed uh by by saying basically you can't out that a, that a company cannot outsource anything to a smaller company or an independent contractor operating as an independent contractor uh, if it's in the usual course of their business so I could fix the window here using an independent contractor, but I couldn't use somebody to do web design because that's in the usual course of my business is to offer a website. You know, that sort of thing is a, um, is a could really throw a wet blanket on all of this uh, exciting activity. And, uh, and so what we're, we're in education phase, trying to, under, to help these, uh, the new legislators and the people that are making the federal rules understand the impact that these proposals would have. You brought up predictive scheduling, the idea of guaranteeing two weeks out exactly what a schedule in retail or restaurant or hospitality is going to be. And if you don't, if you deviate from that schedule, having to pay overtime, well, the way that the workforce works today and kind of the unreliability and uh, you can't, you can't, uh, guarantee what a schedule is going to be two weeks in advance. I, don't, I have a professional position. I cannot tell you exactly what my schedule is going to be two weeks in advance. There's so many things. Imagine if you're running a golf course and it rains. You just don't need as many people on on those days when uh, when fewer people are um, are out on on the course. I mean, these sorts of things. Um, the we we have to make sure that we don't create a climate like we could do everything great with workforce. We could do everything great with um, with um, our housing and, and uh, infrastructure and communities. But if we create a regulatory burden that is so onerous for small business that really they can't survive, they can't make it to maturity, those small businesses making it past the first five years, then, um, well, then all that rest of that work will have been for nothing because remember the three legs of the stool we places need business and we have to make sure that this place is a is a competitive and predictable and reasonable for entrepreneurs that are putting their whole life their reputation their their time their energy their uh their capital into this enterprise i mean most of us have investments and you know and they're spread and diversified for entrepreneurs oftentimes their entire financial livelihood is wrapped up in one singular enterprise. And uh, when you put it in that context, you realize how important it is to make sure that they have the environment that they succeed or, or fail based on the strength of their, uh, of their idea and the purpose for the business and the work ethic they put into it. They shouldn't uh, succeed or fail based on external forces like regulations that are so onerous they can't survive well look it's a policy very close to my heart as a entrepreneur that bet his net worth three times um and uh, understand the uh exhilaration and the absolute terror of uh, uh trying to get that next payroll out and that type of thing um and in that role you're always looking for good people you're looking for ways that you can um, support them so that they can be uh, most productive. Uh, but also it's an expense like, oh, do I really need somebody to do some, do that thing now because I'm, I've got such limited resources um, as a young company? And I, I shudder to think if the state of Michigan or the federal government would have come in and said, um, you can only hire people on 40 hour a week basis um, and not bring on stringers never would have got off the ground in you know enterprises that have turned out to be very very successful uh just wouldn't have happened um so when in your work with the small business association what type of ideal policies are you promoting i understand the defensive part of let's not do that from perhaps folks that haven't actually run a business before but 
are there policies that you're promoting as ideal places to work? Yeah, this would be a, um, first of all, we, we can talk about like government policies, but then there's also best practices and how can yes. small businesses make sure that they're um, in, in the best position to compete and win out there in a very, very competitive uh, job market. The, um, so uh, on, the, on the government side, education is so key. So having uh, education, workforce development and lifelong learning opportunities for people that are well aligned with what the world demands, that, um, that that's, that's just a key, key ingredient. Um, and also that we're not creating more hardship um, than, than, um, than help when, in things like our criminal justice system. You know, there's kind of this, the old, the old, like the 1980s way of lock everybody up you know, has given way to this idea of how do we understand what's the root cause of the problem, fix that problem so we can reduce re recidivism, improve the safety in our communities and get people back on their feet and, and employed. So those types of policies that are really kind of pushing past the old way of thinking and embracing uh, the idea that, uh, that, that people can get back into uh, productive society and it's a benefit to all of us when they do. In the best practices front, this is, it's been really fascinating to watch how, uh, how businesses of all sizes, but I'll, I'll say especially small businesses, have leaned into some competitive advantages that they have. First is flexibility. Now, flexibility is not, don't read that as being just remote. Remote work is one form of flexibility, but there's lots of ways that flexibility can come into, um, into being. I see employers that are, are trying to be as flexible as possible, are giving a new generation of employees that, are, that want to fit work into their life instead of fitting their life into their work. I mean, I'm a, I'm a, I, grew, I did growing up in the 1980s, born in the 1970s. Like to me, I fit, I fit my life into my work. It's just my mindset. You know, my, uh, my work is like my identity. And, but, but I think the faster that those of us who are on the, on the second half of our careers, the faster that we can understand and embrace or just accept that generations coming up after us, millennials and, and Gen Z, um, they look at it very, very different. So flexibility is, is very, very important for, our, um, for, for companies to grow. But I also see happening, um, I see what I see happening is embracing automation and, and uh, artificial intelligence, just technology in general, doing things differently as a response to the lack of finding workforce. So uh, I think under the surface right now, it's, it's funny, and when you have as many members as, as us, we see anecdotes kind of pile up. And, see, and can see and read the story sometimes before the economic statistics show it. And, uh, and what I think is happening under the surface right now is a productivity revolution. And that productivity re revolution is people finding and deploying different processes, systems, and technologies at a smaller scale than ever. It used to be automation was like, are you making this many widgets and you invest in automation and, and that can... Um, you know, then it's worth it to make the investment. But when you can't find people, it it changes that calculus. Like now, it, if if you look at it and say, okay, it's going to get harder in the next ten years to find people, then I more and more entrepreneurs are looking at available technologies to operate more efficiently. How can I still grow without having to hire as many people? It's a different mindset. You know, it used to be that we thought of economic success as how many people that you employ. But as you know, as being a person who has signed the front side of paychecks, that um, you don't start a business because you, inspire, you, you aspire to employ more people. That's a byproduct of the purpose and the mission of the business. You need people to, to grow. Um, in the absence of people, technology has a bigger and bigger role to play in the future. So I see that deployment of technology, but I also see employers that are willing to do more things, to get more involved in problem solving with their workforce to, uh, to help them get past whatever obstacles or barriers that they have. And uh, you know, it's, it's interesting watching it too, like those who get over it quicker, th this idea of like, oh, I never used to have to get involved and make sure that my employees have stuff figured out in their lives and that they've got whatever they need to, to show up 
uh, for work. And But there are people living on the edge that, to you or me, that our car breaking down is just, it's an inconvenience. There are other people where it literally means they lose their job because they just can't figure it out. But those employers that are figuring, that are, that are planning on and embracing the idea of helping their employees figure things out, being flexible, and then helping them to, uh, to, to figure out these challenges are having more success in retaining people, finding people, and uh, just a new world it's different than it ever used to be. Absolutely. Great corporate culture is, I want you to be great at your job. What do we need to do to help you be great at your job? And I know as an employer, I discovered all kinds of different things. Um, and, you know, with labor markets, labor markets will always come into balance, um, that there's going to be a hot skill, there's going to be a deficit of those skills, and then either technology will eliminate that demand uh, or help people become more productive and fill in there. And so what I've always been fascinated with is the, those people that are trying to create yesterday's uh, labor environment versus the future. And, and a couple of examples out here, um, the union uh, for the writers in California, um, predominantly California, the Hollywood screenwriters, they were aiming at the future. I thought that was a great target. They're saying, look, our um, writing 22 episodes for a network broadcast over a season, that world's gone. It's about streaming now, but we can't get paid right for streaming with the current contract. And yet we've seen in our own town, I think it's going away, where um, some of the bigger unions uh, who helped us build a great middle class and um, got you know, people's ability to participate to the maximum in the workforce, did a lot of good things, wanted to try to recreate 1960 again with the number of labor hours that went into building a car and with without the inefficiencies. So unions are, you know, I think a good force when they're joining to build great enterprises. But we've had changes in the state of Michigan, the cradle of organized labor. Um, and, and we eliminated the right to work laws. And now that perhaps is at risk. What's going on? How are the right to work laws designed to work? What are some of the pros and cons? What are some of the risks to that uh, right to work? Uh, legislation that we have today. Yeah, right to work is real simple to understand. It just means that the employee is in the driver's seat. Do they choose to join or pay agency fees to a union or not? Each individual employee decides that for themselves. So, you know, who, are you on the bus- big on the size of uh, business or on the side of labor? Um, right to work is just on the side of the employee. Employee decides. The employee is the boss. It's just like any other association. They're the ones who decide whether or not they join. Is the service worth the cost of joining? And um, and so that's a, in a nutshell, that's all right to work is. But it sends a signal out there to the rest of the world that um, that there's just this embracing, like um, this is the states that are right to work, that have right to work laws, have on balance done better in the last, especially in the last two decades. So when you, you look at where any individual state was before and where they're at now, um, you see that b- between population growth and income growth here in Michigan, I think is a great example that over just a period of about 10 years, um, the amount of, uh, of income growth and job growth, um, the uh, population growth that started coming back, um, there was net inbound migration to right to work states, net outbound migration for those who are not right to work. So there's lots of good supportive economic data to to uh, to support that policy. By repealing it, what happens is Michigan just gets crossed off the list of uh, of places where companies make major investments that aren't already dealing with the labor environment here. What it says is that it's kind of like the old days. Labor unions are back in charge in Michigan. And for a a lot of companies, it's just they look at it and say, you know what? I've got a lot of places in the world I could be. Uh, Let's just cross Michigan off the list. And the sad thing is that we don't even really know how much we lose because we were never even in the ballgame in the first place. When you look at uh, what had happened before, 
like we knew when we were in the game and on the hunt and trying to land some some deal, um, you know, you know, you either won it or you didn't win it. The the big risk that we face with right to work is how many companies cross us off the list, and we we're never even in the game in the first place. Never even know how much you lose. So I think this is um, this will make a this will make some difference. It's hard to you know. There's a lot of factors that go into play. I don't want to oversell it like this is the one thing when michigan went from a shrinking state to a growing state on employment and population and income it was a whole bunch of things that changed becoming right to work was one important facet of that yeah and i know that there are uh critics that will say well right to work for less um but also i i've heard from a lot of my friends that are uh, uaw teamsters a couple afl cios and they felt that there was a disconnect between union leadership and then the rank and file. And to your earlier point, they didn't want to pay the union dues or join the union because they didn't feel that, that it was going to serve them. Um, so it's a again, it's an aspect um, of the labor market. Um, and I also liked a lot of what you said about the uh, recovery from people from addiction or the uh, bringing people that have uh, been uh, incarcerated back into the workforce. Um, this is all fitting in with a lot of things we've talked with Judge Milton Mack and um, other of our guests about. And you want to treat mental health, which addiction is part of, in the community uh, versus they're going to be uh, put in an inpatient facility someplace. So as they can work through their addiction issues, um, get healthy, and uh, start building a life at the same time. I think that's just a, a good society, a compassionate society, and good government. Um, and I'd like to spend a little time, if you would, because I, I don't. I think most people don't know about this story about the uh, the trade, um, and that you were very instrumental in setting up the Gordy Howe International Bridge. Um, and so, kind of take our listeners, readers, and viewers through this. From A to Z, if you would, how big is the trade with Canada? Where does it go through? And what were some of the issues? And how is this bridge project resolving those? Our trade with Canada is a lot bigger than what people realize. And in Michigan in particular, the integrated manufacturing supply chain that goes from really it goes across the whole continent, but especially on either side of the Detroit River, it is huge and um, much of that trade uh, especially the automotive part goes over one bridge so there's a tunnel in detroit but trucks can't go through the tunnel it's not tall enough or big enough the um so that all of the trucks all of the commercial trade goes save for what there's a um you know you can go up to to sarnia but that's a way out of your way for where the manufacturing base really is so over 99 percent of the commercial trade for for the between Michigan and Canada goes over that um, goes over that one bridge in Detroit, and um, that is a um, that's a huge huge risk to have in one ninety year old bridge, and um, and it's and it's not like we, we think about it in terms of terrorism. If if you really wanted to the nine eleven terrorists wanted to really take down the Michigan economy. The Ambassador Bridge probably would have been a, um, a, a a target for them, as opposed to a building or buildings in in um, in New York, because it would have absolutely crippled the automotive industry in um, in North America and especially in America. The um, so this idea of having some redundancy of that man of that um, infrastructure is important, but it also it's a constrictor. There's only so much growth that can happen. Uh, most businesses that trade across the Canadian border are actually small businesses. The volume of trade in dollars are bigger with the big companies because the automotive industry. But in sheer numbers of those who trade, most are small businesses. So everybody's in on this. We also have a huge reliance on Canadian nurses in our um, healthcare system. We would be way short of nurses in Detroit if it wasn't for the ability to go back and forth um, efficiently across that border. So it's a really important aspect. 
what we decided to do uh, back in 2011 is to robustly support a second bridge in Detroit and one that more directly connected freeways. So I-75, um, I-94, uh, to efficiently get them um, to uh, to a bridge that could take them to um, uh, to to really all of the the marketplaces, but eventually including the um, the ports, the Canadian ports on the west side are um, far more open than our, the west coast ports, in the in the uh, southeast ports that are extremely crowded and difficult to get to. So there's a lot of reasons that this is important. It was done through an interlocal agreement with Canada. That's a provision of Michigan's constitution. Um, I was one one of the people on the team uh, that uh, that were engaged in um, in this in building this agreement with Canada. Canada is paying for the bridge, so Michigan has no capital outlay to do it. It's jointly owned by Canada and uh, in Michigan. So the United the the federal government of Canada and the state of Michigan are the two partners in owning this bridge. The tolls will pay back Canada's original investment. Once that investment is paid back, then they'll be split between Michigan and Canada. Um, and of course, go to maintaining the bridge first. This it's, it's such a, um, in a lot of ways, I consider it like a sweetheart deal for Michigan. It's a piece of infrastructure that we desperately need, that our country needs, especially that our state needs, that industries that are concentrated in Michigan need. And um, we did not have to outlay any cash in order to do it. Canada's fronting the entire deal. And uh, and it's under construction right now. It's really exciting to see. It would be um, further down the Detroit River from where the Ambassador Bridge is, from uh, being the area they call Southwest Detroit. It lands in a neighborhood that, um, that would, if you're familiar with the area, called Delray. Oh, yeah. And, yeah, Delray. Um, and so it's a... Um, it's a it's a heavily industrial area in um, in Detroit. It really needs a lot of new investment, and there's a ton of opportunity for logistical style businesses that are right around this uh, this area. So very oh, exciting great. time. The towers are up. The deck is being built right now, and it's going to be a new uh, famous land, landmark for Michigan. Well, it's uh, it makes so much sense, and as a person that obviously likes to build bridges, the common bridge versus building walls. Um, and you, you might not be able to get another country to pay for your wall, but I, if dem demonstrable now that you can get another country to pay for your bridge, um, and that's probably got a, a lot of uh, implications there. Um, and also on the Canadian side, the current bridge to get to Canadian customs, it's 21 or a mile and a half. And then to get onto the 401, which is up to Toronto, the largest city in Canada, was 21 stoplights. Um, so in terms of energy, I mean, you could probably get a climate um, argument out of this. Now the, the new bridge will be connected into the 401 directly up to uh, Toronto. And then on the Michigan side, out to the two major airports uh, in Detroit. And uh, all of that land in Western Wayne County and Eastern Washtenaw County has got bought out for warehouse facilities and other logistic businesses. So um, we've actually been able to see the fruition uh, of this investment coming together. And again, I think another great example of public-private partnerships and what they can do. Um, Brian, this has been a great talk, and I know we could talk a long time about all of the policies related to workforce development so before we close today, what would be some of the best policies that you'd love to see? You'd like to see the federal government or state governments or even local governments say, look, this is a policy that we're going to uh, back in order to have a great workforce. What is it? If you could throw a switch, what would that be? Yeah, well, there's 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 no real simple answers, but I'll give you the, mo uh, the ones that I think are most important. And I would put at the top of the list. The K-12 system, I'd look at states like um, like Maryland, for example, that had an education commission that created a plan to transform that state. I'd look at places like Tennessee that went from a bottom state to a top performing state in a relatively short period of time. Um, Michigan has been sliding in our educational performance and attainment. We cannot afford to have so many people um, graduate without being um, able to uh, to read and have and up to standards and in science and in math. And so 
I would put at the top of the list, um, there's there's actually a, um, at the K-12, there's a, a framework that was negotiated kind of by a strange bedfellows group of organizations, including SBAM, but including uh, also the Michigan Education Association, the Labor Union for Teachers, um, some administrator um, organizations, philanthropy, other business organizations like Business Leaders for Michigan. It's called Launch Michigan. It's a framework for education reform that looks at transparency, governance, accountability, and funding for uh, and for our education system and really tried to model a bit off that Maryland approach of, uh, of an education commission to drive that work forward. And um, it's exciting. So I would put that at the top of the list. If there's uh, all the other stuff that we talk about, if our primary education system does not, um, does not move from a, you know, in, in many cases, a bottom 10 state like we are today, um, if we don't move out of that type of position, I don't think any of the other efforts that we have are going to bear the type of fruit that we need them to. That's uh, powerful in that we were such a strong education state for so long. And I know it's uh, all over the map. There's some of the greatest places and, and some of the worst that are pulling it down. Um, any legislation that you see coming down the pike from the feds or the um, the state government that are particularly problematic other than the ones that we've already talked about yeah i would i would say that the um there's there are proposals that take like that get in between employers and employees so it might be uh, defining and determining what benefit requirements have to be there's a new proposal for family medical leave to create kind of an unemployment uh, insurance trust fund but where employers pay a new tax into a fund to pay for um, family medical leave um, but what ends up happening is they is, is there's there's a slew of proposals, predictive schedules, scheduling we talked about uh, as well. Uh, the idea that changing job descriptions would have to be signed off by by the employee before um, a, a business owner could change a job description. These sorts of things kind of stack on each other and they get in between the employer and the employee. Remember when I told you that employers are small businesses are finding a lot of success in flexibility? Well, yep. it really, when, when the government says, nope, here's exactly the box that employment has to fit inside, then um, really the only competitive thing is what the pay is. And um, in, in that case, um, and, and even in a lot of cases, the government's trying to control that too, but smaller enterprises find themselves in a position where um, they're, they have to, for, comp- for the best talent, they're competing against large uh, employers that have advantages. They can p- provide health insurance with, or under ERISA law instead of under the Affordable Care Act, which is a huge, huge advantage. I mean, so mm-hmm. enormous, I could hardly describe how big of an advantage that big businesses have over small businesses when it comes to offering health care for their employees. So, and like the idea of taking flexibility away from small businesses where they can't just tailor to, all right, I got this talent, I got this employee, I'm going to build what's a, a package around what's important to them. When, they, when the government says, no, we're not going to give you that inflexibility, every employee has to fit inside this box that we're going to give to you, uh, I think that hurts small businesses in a way that is profound compared to their larger counterparts. Yeah, and I find it interesting you mentioned um, health care. Um, it's actually uh, the time for health care being provided by your employer, I think, has come and gone. Um, and, and I've talked about it. We're, we're just about there at this point anyway, given the growth of Medicare and Medicaid and uh, VA and such, uh, we, we need to be realistic about that. Um, anything that we didn't talk about today that you wanted to share with our listeners, our readers and our viewers, or perhaps any closing comments? Um, this has again been very informative and I'm very cheered that we have good people like you who have a, a longitudinal view and an ability to go solve a problem. I think it's really important that uh, that entrepreneurs find their way into a community with other entrepreneurs. There is something magical that happens when business owners get together with other business owners, and it can be a very, very lonely place to, to operate as an entrepreneur. 
you're sweating out payroll this week. It's not like you can confide in your employees about that. You know, it's a um, it, it's, so it can be an, an isolating uh, type of a place. One of the things that we try to do at the Small Business Association of Michigan is to create a, a community of small business owners. That's really who we're here for are the owners of the business. And, uh, and so when you find your way to a community of other entrepreneurs, I think there's some power in that. It's not about selling to each other, although they do sell to each other. Um, it's really about that camaraderie and understanding uh, challenges and uh, problem solving together, getting ideas, bouncing situations off each other. It's a powerful force. So if there's one for any entrepreneur that is watching this, is one thing that I could um, highly, highly recommend is find your way to either a cohort of small business owners or organization that has uh, opportunities to spend time with other business owners and make that a part of your um, of uh, your daily, weekly, monthly, whatever activities to connect in with other people that understand the types of uh, challenges, opportunities, and struggles that you're facing. And, and I would tell you, as a person that was that startup entrepreneur i would heartily endorse that um for me uh the choice was the ypo young president's organization um back when i qualified under the y part of that um <laughs> but it, it's really good to hear that the small business um, uh, group that you're running ha has uh, that type of of uh, service so we're We've been today with our guest, the president and CEO of the Small Business Association of Michigan, our former lieutenant governor, former uh, representative in the House, and former county commissioner, as well as private sector uh, banker. Um, we hope everybody will aspire to a career like Brian Kelly and serve uh, the citizens of your community, your state, and our great country. And with our guest, this is Rich Helpy, your host, signing off on The Common Bridge. Thanks for joining us on The Common Bridge. Subscribe to The Common Bridge on Substack.com or use their Substack app where you can find more interviews, columns, videos, and nonpartisan discussions of the day. Just search for The Common Bridge. You can also find The Common Bridge on Mission Control Radio on your Radio Garden app.